Okay, we are in the final keynote session. I hope you had enjoyed all the sessions as much as I did. I was so excited and inspired and get energized with all the sessions. Thank you all the speakers and panelists for the, the, the participation. The final session is called Building Trust with Government and Business. The reason why I have decided to formulate this session is because this year and last year, uh, Richard Edelman, Richard, was kind enough to ask me to participate in Davos, one of the panel, uh, which uh, Richard Edelman has formulated. At the same time, Ross Warbury, who is the head of uh, uh, Edelman in Japan, has also done here in Tokyo twice about Edelman Trust. And this Edelman Trust is quite interesting in a way that uh, you know, they have surveyed about the trust of the government, business, and those NGOs, and so forth, and scientists, and so forth, and media. And then in, in terms of Japan, up until 2011, there has been no changes. It was boringly stable in terms of government trust and business, business trust. However, after 2011, which is an earthquake and tsunami and Fukushima, the trust towards government and business has suddenly dropped. And therefore, I thought that it would be a good idea to ask Mr. Richard Edelman to come over and talk about what's happening in terms of Edelman trust in, in, in Japan. At the same time, asking uh, Shiozaki-san, who is a, a former uh, chief secretary and uh, chief cabinet secretary under a previous uh, Abe administration, to be representing politicians and government, and also asking uh, Mr. Ken Shibusawa to be representing the government, uh, corporate sector because his uh, ancestor was the founder of Japan capitalism, and he's very famous at the same time. He himself is a very famous uh, business person and working as an NGO person. And I'd like to hand over to Nick Calvin to be moderating this session, and uh, it's gonna, the floor is going to be all yours. So Nick, it's all yours. Thank you, Yoshi. Um, this is the third time I've been involved in something from, uh, for G1 and for uh, Globis. I've been very struck uh, two years on plus uh, after uh, 3.11 of just how profound this issue of trust in uh, business and government remains. And it's probably my perception, we'll hear the metrics in a moment from Edelman, uh, and remi I remind you that there is still a profound problem, in my view, of uh, hearing a lot of the interjections that we've heard today. Let me just give you a sense of what some people uh, among you have been saying from the platform. Um, we have to take care of the TEPCO situation and clear the reputation. A lot that bureaucrats try to cover. We need whistleblowers, and we need a Mr. Snowden in, uh, in our public life here. Um, on the nuclear industry, we must tell the truth. It's not that what people are saying is lies, but they're not telling the people about it. And this is a profound challenge for crisis management anywhere in the world at any point. And uh, another uh, suggestion and a very uh, sharp observation, it seems to me, when uh, the panelists were discussing uh, the nuclear industry here in Japan. We do not think the unthinkable or how to prepare for emergency. Are we prepared? Probably not. So Richard, as I introduce you, a company with 4,800 employees in 69, 67 nations, is it correct? Uh, 67 nations. Therefore, Richard can make this comparison for you between what's happening in Japan and what's not happening in Japan and the rest of the world. And I was struck as well by the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer. We aired it as well on the BBC uh, about the, the importance now of chief executives this year in Davos. And this is um, a, a new report that's just come out building on that trend that was reported back in Davos. Let me just remind you of one incident which sticks in my mind from what was happening on the 27th of March two years ago, and I've got it here, when TEPCO said radiation levels are 10 million times higher than normal. The next day, the TEPCO spokesman, uh, Kuritao, said, that number is not credible. We are very sorry. Whereupon, the chief cabinet secretary, Yukio Adano, said, that is absolutely unforgivable. I put to you, is that the kind of thing, were there to be a similar emergency, which would happen again, whether it be on the business side 
or the government side. I say that as an observer from afar of what has been happening here and the damage that continues to be done even after the Prime Minister's guarantees in Buenos Aires to the IOC a few days ago. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. You need to hold a microphone, yes. <laughs> On now? Good. I keep knocking my sign over. That's a bad sign. Um, so let me just um, try to frame this for you. Um, we've been doing this survey for 13 years. We do it in 26 countries. Uh, we talk to 31,000 people. Um, and we look at people who are both opinion formers, college plus educated, you know, four or five media a day, and the mass public. And so it's a pretty good sense of the world. In the time that we have done this study, we have never seen a more complete and absolute destruction of trust than happened at Fukushima. Japan was, as Nick said, a solidly middle ground country. It wasn't in the optimistic camp, but it certainly wasn't in the pessimist camp. So it went from, you know, solid middle to equivalent to Russia. Now that should give you some idea of a wonderful demise of, of trust. Um, let me give you some of the boxcar numbers. Um, an academic went from 70% trusted to 32%. A chief executive went from 67% to 24 An NGO rep went from 48 to 18 A regular employee went from 59 to 16 And a government official went from 63% to 8 8% trust in government officials after Fukushima. Now, trust in industries, unexpectedly, of course. The energy industry went from 75% trusted, or the second most trusted, to 29%. Um, media went from 54% to 33 So those are the two least trusted industries in Japan today, energy and media. Um, and then across the board, newspapers, TV, radio, magazines, all lost substantial trust. So. Um, what we observe, though, is a year on, and this data is now nine months old, just put in perspective before Abe. Um, institutions have regained about half of the trust that was lost, give or take. Um, but the spokespeople have not. The individuals have not. And so the gap between trust in institutions and trust in their leaders is massive. It's the biggest we see anywhere around the world. 40 or 50 points. And so, again, a chief executive is at 22% trust. That's the lowest of anywhere around the world. And in a world that doesn't trust CEOs, Japan trusts CEOs the least. Government officials and regulators, 15% trust. Again, lowest of anywhere around the world. We're including countries like Argentina in this study. So just so you know which company you're in. Now, also, as to what builds trust in institutions in Japan, it's completely changed since Fukushima. Fukushima, for you, was the effective equivalent of the financial crisis for the US or for the UK. So in effect, today, what matters most in building trust for a corporation is takes responsible actions to address an issue or a crisis. Stated importance, 52%. Performance, 10%. 42-point gap. Second important thing, has transparent and open business practices. 48% expectation, 8% delivery. These are boxcar numbers. The point I'm trying to make to you is this is not simply a government issue. The stain of Fukushima has spread across business from the halls of TEPCO. The expectation of business has completely changed. It used to be you make money, you have a charismatic CEO, you kind of make nice new products, and you're trusted. Not anymore, folks, not since Fukushima. The world has flipped on its head. Okay, so a few important um, macro observations. One, dispersion of authority. It used to be that authority in Japan and many other markets was vertical. Top down, from the mountain, Moses delivered to the people. It's just been Yom Kippur for those of you Jews in the audience. Um, in New York, that gets a big laugh, but <laughs> there are not that many of you. You were in synagogue with me. I saw you because um, I was here. Um, but um, 
the important point is the failure of the vertical information flow to deliver during the crisis of Fukushima meant that the horizontal had to substitute for it. The peer-to-peer -peer communication, the importance of the man from Chernobyl, who was, in fact, the credible voice, because he actually went. He went to Fukushima, as opposed to a lot of the mainstream media, who was reporting from Tokyo exactly what they were told by the company and the government. Um, so the horizontal has now actually eclipsed, in some way, the vertical. Um, because it's based on personal ex observation, it's based on experience, and it's also uninhibited. It, it is as reported, as they say. Not that it's necessarily credible, um, as, because it doesn't have sourcing, but it is part of a picture. Second, um, it's easy to lose this um, evanescent thing called trust. It's very hard to get it back. And the problem for leadership is that they haven't absorbed this. And especially in Japan, the chief executives and government officials have not quite absorbed this lesson that you have to actually change how you communicate and to whom you communicate and when you communicate. I give you an example by comparison in New York. Um, there was a big snowstorm over Christmas a couple of years ago. Um, the Mayor's office did what it usually does, which is issue um, press updates on an every 12-hour basis, and here's the number of streets we've cleared, and here's what's going on. Meanwhile, people are tweeting and blogging madly and saying, you know, I'm screwed, I can't get out of my house, the place is going crazy, there's no subway service. And, and that became the story, that the city was out of it. During Hurricane Sandy, 18 months later, the city basically absorbed social into its basic mainstream media operation and basically created a platform so that people who were tweeting or um, posting on Facebook were absorbed into a sort of overall picture of what was going on and the city services would respond on Twitter or on Facebook and say, the cops are on their way, we're doing what's necessary, relax, we're coming. And when they did, there was a photo of somebody being saved from the flood or whatever it was to prove, in fact, the point. So it opened up the platform. That was the big difference, composed to the you know, command and control, which is evident here. Now, I'm gonna make a very unpopular one-minute speech about the press club system. Um, it's only unpopular because my colleagues in Japan are terribly nervous about what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say and leave tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but the press club system, has got to change because it is not today's way of communicating. It has to evolve. You cannot have a group of pre-programmed, pre-nominated people come into a room, get the story, and report it as is dictated by the government official or the person from the corporation because there is news coming out from all sorts of other social sources. And also, there no longer can be a discrimination between that's what you tell to Japanese media in the press club and that what you tell to Gaijin media because they are somehow foreign. Well, these foreign people actually use um, social sources probably more than the Japanese media. And they're going to be reporting what the social sources say, whether or not you like it. So I would suggest that the press club system have a serious look. Was that subtle enough, Ross? Okay. What's your real message then? Get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Junk it, uh, because it's obsolete. It's obsolete because the world has passed it by. It's a buggy whip operation, and it should go. Um, and it, it, it's way too respectful, and it's way too much command and control. It is the ultimate expression of the vertical axis. So Ross, uh, that was the end of the media training. Yes, sir? Well, look, I mean, you know, I, I consider myself at the bleeding edge on this. Um, but the, the other thing that I want to tell you is that if you think of the world as a uh, pyramidal structure, which many of us studied in school, you know, C. Wright Mills and the pyramid of, of influence and, and whatnot, that's still there. It's still important. And you still can tell a story through elites and professors and all that. But there's a corresponding inverted pyramid which actually starts with people who are on the scene. And they are communicating upwards. And their story sometimes leaps 
and leapfrogs to the elites. And so, in a sense, it's now, it's, it's now a diamond shaped. It's not a pyramid anymore. And so you should just think of this um, in, in your you know, process as who do I have to talk to? Um, employees, NGOs, I've got to talk to community members. Yes, the regulators. Yes, your investors. Yes, the mainstream media. But there are all these other people. So, you know, communicate this way and this way is sort of my message. So, Nick, does that kick us off well enough? Indeed, yes. Um, this is about governance and executive behavior. And do please, as we did so successfully in the first session, if you're thinking ideas at the moment, just stick them down in a couple of lines or whatever uh, and put them as a message to me because it allows me to work out what all of you are thinking. We can come to questions as well. But, Richard, just broaden it, can you, to what you said in the Davos um, trust barometer about particularly the role now of chief executives and how that has changed because it, this is not unique to Japan but it's about the executive culture the executive assumptions of what they have to do in the public space when there are difficulties and what they don't do uh, sorry chief executives basically have the mentality of control and th they do because they, they, they want they want to have plans and they want to be able to deliver a message and get get on with it and the fact is that, um, first of all, institutional trust is here, CEO trust is here. You've got to go with others who can tell the message. Also, listen to this. In Japan, you have to hear, see, or read something between five and seven times today bef before you believe it. That's up from two pre-Fukushima. Two to seven. Two to seven. So you're not going to have the CEO out seven times. It, it, there's not that many media. You have to have employees bloggers, Facebook posts. It has to be a pastiche. It has to be um, a quilt. Um, so a smart chief executive will, in a sense, say what he or she has to say, but have surround sound and have other people who are so-called surrogates and people who are informed. What has got to change, in your view, based on everything else you do around the world, um, particularly when it comes to those issues of governance, culture, behavior, picking up some of the things that you've heard from other sessions today? Well, I think, uh, in fact, in the energy session, you know, uh, the, the big question is, is the public going to accept um, the relighting of the nukes? And that's a completely open question. And based on today's level of credibility, certainly of TEPCO, I think you'd have to wonder whether that's a possible uh, thing. I mean, you know, do they have the license not just to operate, but actually in some way to, to exist? <laughs> I mean, this is a real problem. This company has systematically been late because they have felt and they have judged that it is too risky for the people to really know what is going on. Well, who are they to say, actually? The government, it seems to me, has to let people know so that people can then have an honest discussion about the right way forward. Are you suggesting there needs to be essentially a re-engineering of the DNA, of the relationship between government, corporates, and what the people expect. Yeah, I mean, th there is not an inherent um, uh, license for these companies to go on as they have. They have lost their ability to play, seems to me. They, they now have to completely re-earn based on serious change in how they play. Yeah. Okay, give us your thoughts, and if you want to challenge whether publicly, by name, or anonymously, it's up to you. Um, we're open for business up here, and we are on the record, I just, should just remind you. Um, now, Shiozaki-san, let me come to you, because you are uh, also a senior director of the Special Committee for Investigation of Nuclear Power Issues. Do you recognize what you've just heard from Richard Edelman as the cultural behavioral problem? Um, yes, I do agree uh, with uh, uh, Richard uh, and... Uh, this typical accident in Fukushima reminds me uh, or controlling the situation of typical in Fukushima. It reminds me of what, what I experienced in, in the, uh, the first Abe cabinet, that is, <laughs> that is uh, pension record problems. Maybe Japanese are all familiar with this issue, but maybe not for foreigners, but uh, it's a it's a, a big loss of our pension record, personal record, uh, which might uh, uh, end, end up by paying less in pension. And that was really uh, a serious problem. And uh, 
I think that's one of the, or, or I would say, the main co reason why we lost the two, uh, two, 2007 upper house election at the time. We do have many other problems like a suicide of uh, uh, one of the ministers and uh, Miss, uh, 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 well, uh, telling a rather uh, rough way about uh, Hiroshima and how all those uh, by ministers. But I think the main reason was pension record issues. And that because uh, the reason why is that it's a personal issue for every, each individual people. But this time, I guess the uh, Fukushima accident is not just for Japanese. It's a global issue. And uh, uh, I do uh, uh, think that uh, we have to be uh, more, well, I think the, the government, I, I, I do agree that uh, Abe cabinet was correct in uh, stepping forward, uh, involving, or the government involving in the process of uh, this uh, de decommissioning and also the treatment of uh, contaminated water issue. But I think still the way the government is handling this is rather vertical, as he said. And this should be more horizontal. And I think the whole de decommissioning is, uh, uh, process, and also uh, including the contamination, contaminated water uh, handling, must be uh, uh, controlled internationally, not just domestically in Japan. But can I keep pressing you on, on, on the culture, if I may? The government has had enough consultants in telling them where the problem is. You've got Richard Edelman saying this here based on metrics in public, but there's a lot of advice being given to the government. Get your act together. Here we are two and a half years on with this kind of language still being used. So what's, what's the challenge? Why can't there be a recalibration, a re, redesigning of the bureaucrats, the civil servants, the ministers, those in power, and particularly those in the corporate sector who have responsibility? As you introduced me as, as, a, as a, a, a chief uh, director of this special committee on uh, nuclear issue, uh, that was created by uh, us uh, and uh, also suggested by the uh, special investigation committee uh, in the Diet, uh, headed by uh, uh, Dr. Kurokawa, uh, to have the uh, uh, committee to uh, uh, oversight the uh, uh, new regulatory uh, regime. And uh, I, I guess uh, uh, what we have to do is to change the culture of nuclear regulation. Is there a realization of that or not? Uh, well, we do realize it, the importance of it, and we are pressing the, this independent uh, uh, body of regulation. But I think it's, it's not, uh, hasn't been uh, achieved the goal yet, of course. And uh, we are trying to change that. And also, uh, the decommissioning process is not uh, the, solely the issue of uh, uh, regulatory uh, organization. This is the whole, you know, energy agencies issue mainly. And uh, uh, so as a, as a government, as a whole, we have to change the culture of handling this and making more, much more transparent by uh, supp supplying all the inf information real time to the specialists all around the world because what we are facing is something no one has ever tried to solve. Are you thinking the unthinkable? I'm going to quote Tanaka-san, if I may, from earlier, where you said, and I repeat myself, we need to think the unthinkable and prepare for an emergency. Are we prepared? Probably not. Here we are having this discussion still, two and a half years on. I think we have to uh, go much, much forward by control, well, having the control tower as a as a as a nation, as a as a Japan, and including uh, the uh, whole knowledge and uh, uh, personal uh, uh, personal uh, uh, assistance from all around the world by the specialists, uh, so as to contain and control this whole situation as possible. All right. Well, look, there's a there's a lot to keep pressing you on, I think, um, and also on the business side. But Glenn Fukushima, can I come to you? Uh, can we get the microphone over there? Because you actually made a point in the earlier session, and you've also made a rather important point here. Uh, microphone there uh, about the fact that 
not enough Japanese leaders, particularly in the corporate sector, get out there and understand what's happening in the rest of the world when it comes to credibility and so on. And you've used some pretty fruity language in the message you've just sent me about particularly... Um, uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll read it. You can read it, yeah. <laughs> Wait, which ends, or vote the bums out. Japanese respondents to public opinion polls may express distrust, cynicism, or criticism, but they don't riot in the streets or vote the bums out. The same LDP that created the culture of collusion that led to the Fukushima disaster now has 70% support. The real problem is that Japanese voters are too undemanding of their political leaders, and the leaders are not held accountable. No easy solution. Shiozaki-san, do you stand guilty on that? Uh, <laughs> not you personally, but uh, your party. Well, we have to admit that the, 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 everything we have done about nuclear power is uh, on, well, our responsibility. And, uh, but as I said, we have to ha go through drastic change of culture. Well, he's calling it the culture of collusion. The LDP culture of collusion that led to the Fukushima disaster. Well, the culture of LDP is also changing, I would say, from collusion to, to, uh, what? to uh, uh, more open-minded. And uh, um, I think we, we have to uh, change the culture of, well, I think in a way, bureaucrats and, and, and also politicians are too confident without ground that we can manage it. I think we have to be most, more humble to accept that the limit of our ability to control and uh, uh, handle, the, manage the, all the problems. Richard, just a data point, if I can, before I go to Shiba san what's, wh what's your uh, impression? Is that the LDP uh, and those in power are, if you like, living on borrowed time when it comes to this issue? Microphone. Microphone, microphone sorry. When you have, uh, um, we asked the question, do you trust government leaders to tell you the truth in a difficult situation and 20% say yes? Uh, you have a problem. <laughs> it's, uh, that's it. Uh, you know, can't be more blunt. Yes, we have a... There are no alternatives. Well, but there are alternatives in the sense that they are trying to fix themselves. I mean, look at the way uh, the prime minister is communicating himself. You know, he calls in... Um, for people who've had, uh, uh, you know, problems in their lives, whatever, he's photoed with them. He, he's a very active participant on Facebook. He's trying to lead from the front, and that's a good beginning, seems to me. He has to drag a lot of people along with him who are a little nervous about all that. But what do you find in when you're being paid as a consultant to change culture, whether in a government or in a corporate, about how easy it is to change the behavior in a very strict uh, stovepipe organization where DNA is so ingrained? You know, Nick, I would say that was probably the best descriptor of Unilever before Paul Pullman got there. I mean, it was almost a, a government bureaucracy as a company. And he got there and he left, he said, we're going to double the sales and keep our resource use flat. He had a very clear objective. And then people said, oh, he's serious. And so I think somehow TEPCO's got to get to this level of a chief executive. I don't know who's running the place. But. All right, Shiba Sawasan, let me come to you representing business here. And I hope I hear other voices as well. Do you, by and large, accept um, the criticism, accusation that really you've got to change your act and how you do it as senior executives in the C-suite in the boardroom? Thanks very much. Um, it's an honor to voice the opinion of the corporate sector as an NPO. Um, on this uh, topic of trust, actually I had a practice run last night uh, with my teenage son, right? <laughs> we had a little mishap, so we had a little conversation. Um, and I said, you know, do you know what the character for trust is in Japanese? And you probably don't, so I'll tell you. It's 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 a character for person, and it's a character for speaking. So so trust is actually what you say. And so the problem that we have in Japan right now with our corporations, with our government leaders, is what they say isn't. You know, they say a lot of different things, and it doesn't really uh, reflect reality or or more importantly the action, right? And so so I think that that that's the key point. Um, we talk about culture a lot, you know, um, and yeah, it's different, but it's sort of a, it, 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 it sort of, it puts, it, it puts Japan in a box and you, know, you, can't, you can't change culture, you know, overnight. Um, but um, I'm 
what strikes me as so interesting is like, let's say if you did a barometer on if you dropped your wallet in a city, what are the chances of that wallet coming back with all the cash, everything intact, Tokyo, all the, all the, all the other you know, uh, cities? And it'll be right, right, right up at the top, if not the top. And so, so my, my sort of uh, enigma about this whole thing about trust is if you, if you look at Japanese as individuals, you, know, you, can, you can trust them, right? But once they get into the organization, then it, it sort of morphs into something completely different. Um, and I think for, for the corporate leaders, um, um, I, I feel like many of them, um, you know, I, I, mean, I know them as individuals, trustworthy, but when you, when you get into that role of the CEO of a company, they can't, they can't speak their own minds, it seems like, because they have so many people to answer to, not just the shareholders, not just the employees, but former CEOs who are still inside the company right down the hall on the corner room. You know, and so, so, the, so, um, so, in, in, for TEPCO, as individuals that I know within the company, very, very good people, you know, but once you get it inside in the organization, like you said, they, they lost the vertical and they, they lost touch with, with what was going on on, on, on the ground. Um, and so, um, another aspect of this sort of uh, organizational uh, hindrance for, for Japan, I always feel. Uh, when I go abroad, let's say I was in Myanmar last week, huh? and, 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 and they go, Japanese technology, great. And, but, you know, a lot of Japanese have been, been coming to Yangon, um, but they do a lot of research. And research, and research, and research, and research. Yeah. But, but if the Koreans or the Chinese come, one, two meetings, and the deal is done. So, so for, for trust, in, in terms of not just you know inside domestically but internationally, uh, being able to deliver with speed is you know it's 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 it, it, that's that's what it's all about and, and I think Japan is missing a very big lot of big opportunities in the developing nations uh, in the countries in the in the world because because we can't answer to that speed question, and the reason I think that is is going back to my junior uh, or my teenager son, the way Japanese are educated in this, in this country. Um, it's educated to provide the right, correct answer, right? And so, so, so like people at Tepico are thinking, what's the right, correct answer to answer to all these you know, questions? But, uh, but the more important educational sort of underpinning is, and especially in this environment, is how do I you know, answer the right questions? Then you have people around you that have the answers. Do you reckon that the corporate world here is in any way calibrated to understand the new reality of what I call the tyranny of real time and the real time information space? Yes, there obviously there are co co uh, companies that can answer to that, um, but but many people, <laughs> many most corporations majority. that are not. But but if you th but but to be fair with the Japanese corporations, if you look at their corporate earnings the last several years, you know this is before Abenomics. You know, many, many actually companies, despite the strong yen, despite all these difficulties, despite high electricity prices, their corporate earnings was the, you know, was the highest ever in their sort of, you know, corporate history. You know, many of them actually, you know. But what you see is brand and reputation destroyed in minutes often yes, by exactly. crisis. Yes, exactly, yes. Including like with BP. Let me, uh, Richard, let me just put one other quote that you, you, you gave earlier um, to shibasawa -san. The stain of TEPCO has stretched to the corporate world. Do you feel that? Very much so. To, to ship us out with oh, oh, sorry. 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 Yeah. Let me see. The strain of uh, TEPCO to the entire corporate world? Is That's it, what is Richard it, was said. That, was that sort of the... Um, um, to the outside world, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. But, but, but is, is TEPCO as an organization, it's a very, very, you know, bureaucratic organization. So if you compare that with, you know, Globus, you know, <laughs> to totally different, yes? And, and, and many of the corporations here in Japan are not like TEPCO, like corporations. Many of them are small businesses here in Japan, yeah? And so um, to characterize in one brushstroke saying that TEPCO uh, stained the entire Japanese corporate world as being that model is not entirely accurate or fair, I think. All right. Uh, Richard, come back. Satish Selvanathan, where are you, please? Uh, could we get the microphone? And I'll come to you in a moment. Richard. Richard. So in the United States, the reason that companies are not transparent is actually 
they're afraid of their lawyers. Because the chief counsel says, don't say anything, we're going to be sued. It, my perception is here, it is much more a function of culture. And it's the culture of the army. Uh, you know, the, the boss makes the decision and everything else, you salute and just go. So in a certain way, um, both of them are difficult to cope with. I perceive that certainly in the last couple of years, chief executives are increasingly telling their lawyers to be quiet and stay in the corner. Um, in order to get ahead of the problem. And I hope that that starts to happen here. But can, it's I a say, can I just add one, just one point? I, I think in Japan, the boss can't tell the people what to do. That, that's the problem here in Japan. With the other you know, corporations in US or Europe, when the, when the CEO says do it, people do it because otherwise if you don't do it, you're fired. Yeah, but 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 in Japan, um, you know, still there's this life term employment and things like that. And especially in a large corporation, CEO says go right, and everybody's going like, well, maybe, well, maybe you should still keep on going straight. And so they don't really listen to what's being said from the top. That's a big problem, I think, here in Japan, especially for the larger corporations. Sounds like a massive problem. Well, that, that's 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 because it's not CEO that decides, probably. Somewhere else, the decision is made. Oftentimes, that's part of, part of the problem of Japanese corporate governance, I guess. Can you trace who has made the decision within the, the corporation? Pardon me? Can you track who did make that decision? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Very weird uh, uh, way of uh, making decisions, I guess. But Richard, Richard, in what you've been analyzing, the, the accountability essentially of the C-suite, the chief executive, the board, you can't just hide a decision like that somewhere in the structure, can you? No, it has to be why we're doing it, how we came to this point, how we're going to prove it. You know, third-party validation, if you can partner with a non-governmental organization or a university, you need all these things to line up. And it's got to be quick. And so if it's this kind of amorphous mass and we don't know where it, the decision's made, that's pretty hopeless. For, for How would you calibrate the cost and the price if this is now, not now confronted? I mean, for corporate Japan, this is, uh, again... You know, you may again disagree with me, but I, I think in a, in a perception sense, all of Japanese companies are now seen slightly askance. You know, you sort of go, can they really, you know, move at the pace of business? You know, that's a problem. Shubhazawa-san. Yeah, it is a problem, but 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 at the same time, it, it that is a perception, and I agree with that. But but there are, I think, companies that can move much much quicker. And I think part of it is actually, I think we talked a little bit about governance, um, but um, we, need, we need more governance of outside directors in Japanese corporations, no doubt, no doubt. You know, and the resistance to many of these larger Japanese corporations was that if you have outsiders, we can't make decisions quickly. But, um, but, you know, but, but I'm thinking we need to have outside directors that are senior, the directors of the companies, to ask the right questions, as I mentioned before. Right? You need to have different views and say, what, 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 what's going on here? Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the company has to answer to that. But there's been a lack, lack of that, right? But it's, it's opening up. Shiozaki-san, would you say that's accepted by the government now, that that is a, an urgent regulatory uh, expectation? Uh, I, th I think it's going to be uh, one of the focal points of uh, uh, the legislation which is going to be handed out to the uh, extraordinary session in autumn. And uh, uh, DPJ government uh, uh, made a legislation uh, for in introducing uh, so-called independent directors, but uh, it's not a strict requirement for companies to introduce them. But uh, uh, I think we, we, we've, we, I, we have to change the corporate culture in order to have um, more much more momentum in abenomics, and I'm thinking about well, actually, in the in the in the package of growth strategy in uh, released in July or oh, June uh, uh, of the by the government uh, included the the intention to just hand it out the same uh, legislation uh, from DPJ days, but I we are thinking from LDP side to go a lot more forward in order to 
require them to introduce in order to change. And there's a the recognition culture. of the urgency, is there? Yeah. Right. All right, let me get a few more views. Satish, can we get the microphone to Carl Kay as well? Satish, because you've just, no, keep the microphone, but um, you've just been involved in a turnaround uh, with, with a broken down company, but you've got a particular observation on the trust barometer within companies. Yeah, guys, I think um, many people in this part of the world probably not even trusting their own CEOs from within the firm. Um, I started my career in the US. I'm used to a certain way of working. I worked there 12 years. You answer the question that's given to you and you answer it the right way. In this part of the world, you answer the question with what the CEO wants you to answer with. And if you keep doing that, the firm's just gonna go uh, uh, completely haywire. I have run the turnaround of a firm in Malaysia, which was victim to, to just this thing. Investments were made that were bad because the CEO wanted to make them. There was no accountability, there was no trust, there was no reason. How do we change this? I don't know, it probably is something uh, cultural. But you make a point of CEOs sticking their head in the sand. CEOs will put their head in the sand, the board does not hold them accountable. How do we fix it? All right, Carl Kay? Yeah, um, I, I think what, what I, my comment that I sent you has been sort of said in some ways, but just the, maybe the point to add is that you know, in Japan, typically, if the leader of a large organization, um, I, I said, is kind of symbolic, plays more of a symbolic role until things fail, and then they have to either resign to take responsibility, or in an extreme case, in in in, in very extreme cases, commit suicide. And I've I've had the fortune of working um, with Mr. Yanai of Fast Retailing um, over the last couple of years in 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 some projects, and. You know, and I, I share his view that that's ridiculous, that that doesn't solve the problem. I mean, certainly resigning is, going, is, is running away from the problem, and it's defining the problem sort of personally rather than actually dealing with the problem, and it's not getting anywhere. And, and suicide, there, there's this issue in Japan of, of this extreme solution, and then the, the media will drop its investigations into an issue when someone commits suicide. That's sort of the end, and everyone is supposedly satisfied. And, and um, it's... These, these are not rational, progressive ways of dealing with problems. Thanks, Carl. That uh, phrase there, Richard, head in the sand, what do you see around the world? Nick, I, I think actually um, a lot of companies ha have this attitude that um, communication is trivial. That, in fact, we're going to work on the real problem. And the real problem is an engineering problem. Or the real problem is a supply chain problem. Or whatever it is. And all this other stuff of, you know, talking about it. Oh, that's show business or that you know, tall flowers get their heads cut off, you know, that uh, we should just be one of the crowd because we should, we should be subservient to government or the trade association. I, I actually think that, uh, in a sense, crowdsourcing the issue is hugely helpful because it, A, shows that you're listening, B, that you actually might learn something, um, and C, that you're unafraid to let uh, bad news sort of get out and then show we're dealing with it and then answer. The, the New York City example about uh, the snowstorm versus the hurricane, the two uh, examples. So the smarter companies, Nick, are using this, this, this need for the horizontal to advantage. Let me uh, can, I make one, can I make one point? Please do, yes. Yep. In, in, in the Japanese context, when you use the word take responsibility, it, it's a little bit different from the West. You know, like if, it, if, you, if you're in a Western company, if you're taking responsibility, the buck stops here and you're going to fix it, that, that's taking responsibility. Uh, here in Japan, when you say take responsibility, whether you're a politician or, or you know, a CEO, it means you're fired, you're, you're out, you know. And, and, and the reason why I think that sort of exists is part of the role of, of the top figure in, in Japan was for that role. You know, you, you take off the head and the body remains and you put a new head in. And so, so, so the role of the CEO or the top leader of an organization in Japan is a little bit different. We kind of got back to the cultural sort of stuff, but, but, but there is a difference of that sort of thing about responsibility, taking responsibility. Could I get a microphone to Jonathan Kushner, please, wherever you are, right at the back. Um, responsibility, Shiozaki-san. Uh, how much do you see this still a problem? Shall I tell you why I asked that question? because a senior official from the foreign ministry two weeks after Fukushima at a conference in Brussels in public on the record said, we knew what was going on. We had all the information, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. 
what to do with it. We just couldn't get the information out there at a speed, and no one could really take the decision about how to get the information out in a way that the public expects. Even if it's imperfect, incomplete, it's better than nothing. So it comes back to responsibility. Who can take that responsibility in government? Uh, sadly, Tom Tamaguchi is not here to talk about what the feeling may be. I don't think he is anyway. He said he was leaving um, uh, about the responsibility in the prime minister's office. But it was something I think, if I may paraphrase Richard, you said in your trust barometer, that comment has to come from the top now. Otherwise, no one else is really going to believe it. Well, in, in the case of uh, this accident in Fukushima, I think we, the, uh, it taught us that uh, uh, we cannot rely on the, the old bureaucracy of uh, first information flow and also decision making at, at the same time. And partly, as I said, because, uh, well, the, the main reason is that uh, what's happening is mo mostly beyond the capability of uh, regular bureaucracies that are right in the center of decision-making process or vertical decision-making process. And uh, um, I think what we, well, and bureaucrats, we, we have Mr. Tanaka right here in front of me, uh, but uh, I'm so accustomed to saying everything is under control and everything is all right, uh, but without knowing the exact uh, uh, precise uh, uh, details of what's happening and the real uh, meaning of it. And especially, uh, um, in, in many cases, it's all right because it's, it's not so difficult problems. But uh, it, it, when it comes down to this nuclear uh, issues, I think it's almost impossible for regular bureaucrats, including the, uh, the NISA, the old uh, uh, regulatory body, which was uh, contained in the a energy is agency. And so right now, <clears throat> what we have to do is change the, well, back to the basics of um, uh, governance system, but with the different set of uh, input, uh, uh, not just from bureaucracy itself and uh, familiar scholars that always give us good information about something serious. But we have to get the new information flow from somewhere that we did not have, which has more competence in these areas. Tadaka-san, did he quote you correctly? I just want to give you a right of reply, just to be sure uh, that he did quote you correctly, given that you were at the International Atomic Energy, uh, uh, yeah, Energy well, Agency, rather, in, right. in, in Paris okay. at the time. Yeah, before, I was very good friend with uh, Shiozaki sensei Bef and, Well, before uh, today. And, and, no, no, no. And, and even we tried very hard to change the Japanese financial market with help from, help from him. And we did a great job of doing lots of regulations, hitting the Minister of Finance. So this kind of thing, change is possible. When? But a culture of no problem. Well, no, culture of no problem is when the government officials are instructed to say that, they will say that. And unfortunately, these days, in the recent couple of years, the government officials are trained or ordered by the politics. It's not your job to decide. You will just prosecute what you are told. And unfortunately, Meti official or Ministry of Foreign Affairs guys didn't play enough role to convince the public and uh, politicians to do the right thing as a professional. So in that sense, I agree that the government officials didn't play enough role for the convincing DPJ of restarting nuclear power or convincing DPJ that nationalization of Senkaku Island is a terrible idea. Right. Well, Another thing, but some bureaucracy did good thing. I don't like Ministry of Finance. I hate them, but, <laughs> but they did the right thing of raising consumption tax and introducing the social security uh, reform by convincing Liberal Democratic Party and Democratic Party of Japan. So. For the 
country. They did the right thing. So in, so in a way, I respect the judgment of the Ministry of uh, Finance, but unfortunately, the defeat at the Fukushima probably put Meti in a very awkward and, uh, let's say, difficult position to say anything about nuclear in the future, as well as the foreign ministry probably are hesitant to say against the right thing to Prime Minister Noda. Richard, given uh, what you identified in your, na in in your global uh, trust barometer back in, uh, in, in January, and this is a derivative of it, particularly for, for this area, um, how would you say this core problem should be tackled, not just here in Japan, but what do you see elsewhere? The authoritarian nature of it coming down from the board or from the minister's office, compared to the potential for inclusivity and challenging and get some kind of consensus within an organization of how best to pitch things to maintain trust with the public in a time of difficulty or crisis. Well, let me just uh, recall to you that um, the CEO of BP, Tony Hayward, um, after the big spill in the Gulf, thought that he was doing the right thing by going and walking the beach and expressing his, you know, deep, deep uh, sorrow for what had happened and the commitment of the corporation and all that. But he was not the engineer able to actually talk about the solution. And he was terribly overtired and said something incredibly stupid about wanting to get his real life back. Um, and he was pictured also on a yacht sailing uh, two weeks later in the, wherever he was in the North Sea. So um, I think the best approach, Nick, in these sorts of situations is set up your crisis team, make sure that you've got tendrils into the organization, make sure that you're not just listening to your top executives. You've got to actually have people on the ground whom you talk to directly and get your feedback, but also listen to what's on social media and then let that guide your behavior somewhat. What about the imperative to get information and then to share it? Nick, it has to be 100% a sort of digital newsroom approach where you get information and you put it up and you say, this is what we know, here's what we're doing about it, you know, it doesn't have to be in one minute, but it certainly has to be within, you know, half an hour kind of thing, because that's the way the BBC is playing it now. Uh, don't others. talk about the BBC. <laughs> I'm not here. That was my BBC little. Make sure he's awake there. <laughs> I'm awake, um, Jonathan. I've come. To, I, I've come to you because you make a, a point, picking up on Shibusawa San's a point about education, about where the potential is, picking up as well on what Richard has just said. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I thought that the, um, the point that Shibusawa san uh, made earlier about education is really, really striking. And so long as in Japan people are not taught to think for themselves uh, and to question authority, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to see lasting change. Um, I think in this session, the morning, in the morning session today, also there was a, a question about what should be in the, in the fourth arrow of Abenomics. Um, I, I clearly think that educational policy needs to be on the agenda. Um, but you're not really hearing about it. It's kind of on the fringes of the issue, but it's not really hearing, you're not hearing about it yet as an urgent issue. Um, and while we're talking about education and, and communication, particularly in an international sense, it's also pretty uh, urgent that English education needs to improve in Japan. And it's, it's not just a matter of uh, learning by rote and learning the grammar. Clearly, as we have today seen, there's many Japanese here that can communicate very eloquently on issues. And those people need to also be out and in in, in, in convincing the rest of Japanese society of the importance of communicating in English with the outside world. Greg Story, you make a point. Can I, can I? Please do, yes. I just want to get the microphone to Greg Story, please. Where are you, Greg? Please, down here, about management systems. Uh, about uh, uh, what you said, fourth arrow. Uh, actually, the educational reform is included in the third arrow already. <laughs> Especially, uh, as Shibusa-san said, uh, Japanese have been, or kids have been trained to get to the so-called right, correct solution. And it is symbolized in the, uh, and the way uh, universities uh, uh, accept uh, students. They all are decided by the scores from the top. So how many points you get. It's, it's, so you have to have right solutions so what we are now doing in the third arrow 
is to change the first governance of universities, colleges, and to appoint uh, a president by the board, not, not through election in the universities by professors and even secretariat. And it's absurd. And always, and, and, and the second point is they redefine the faculty meeting as the uh, simple advisory board of the president of the universities in order not to make faculty members just you know, always uh, uh, saying no to drastic reform of universities, including the entrance exams. And always faculty members are the ones who are against the changing this uh, uh, entrance examination from you know, just setting the scores uh, to so-called admission office style, uh, picking up very unique students to university. So we are going to uh, go through this reform of education, but already in the, in the meetings in, education, in the Ministry of Education, all the people from universities are all resisting to this reform already. So we have to fight back. Horisan, should I ask you, as you're running an educational institution here, uh, and we're speaking English all day today, let's get a microphone, um, okay. just stand up, uh, about whether, how significant you see this as a, as a problem. Okay, uh, let me just talk about the organizational issues. And but also this resistance. About, about the education as well. In terms of organization, we, in, in Japan, we call it middle upside down, middle up and down. <laughs> middle managers are in charge and leaders, top management are not so in charge. So in peaceful time, it works quite well because man middle managers are right on the places and what's happening and they know what's going on. But in terms of crisis, it doesn't work because leaders have to be in charge of it and leaders are not capable of understanding about grasping about what's going on. At the same time, organization is not capable of coming up with solution or coming up with good communication. I am on the Global Agenda Council on New Model Leadership. And we used to, we had this discussion because we, everybody is having tablets and mobile phones, smartphones, and they know about what's going on in Fukushima, but Prime Minister has to come back to the podium and to the PR people in about two or three hours. The organization was not capable of it. And so we have come down to the conclusion that it used to be, we call it warm heart and cool head was what was needed to become good leaders. Now it's warm heart, cool head, and smart and authentic communication is so much important. So what is important is uh, uh, communication. In terms of education, I think it's also changing. And uh, I think it's fair to say that all those uh, data has been collected last November, therefore Abenomics changes has not been reflected. And therefore, uh, if we see what's going on in terms of government uh, trust and corporate trust, we'll see what's going to happen. If it doesn't change this, we have to come back again <laughs> to discuss about Richard, this Richard, you wanted to pick up on a couple of points because now what I'm getting is a cluster of remarks about decision making and also middle management. I'm going to go to Greg's story in a moment. So we've talked a lot about arrows. We haven't talked about a bow, um, <laughs> the Yumi. And to me, the bow, uh, which launches the arrows, um, has to be radical transparency. That the new standard that you teach your uh, students is that uh, nothing is able to be kept secret. And uh, it's going to come out. And if you are smart enough, you'll find these pieces and assemble it into a coherent uh, picture and do it on a current basis. But radical transparency is going to be very hard, very cross-cultural, but very central to the success of these arrows. Can I just add that just transparency doesn't solve the problem because somebody needs to read what's being transparent to them. And that's probably the role of the education. Just having the data out there, I mean, many people can't read it. So if that's the case, then we have to present the data in a way that it's easily usable. So it can be video, it can be pictures, it can be first-person testimony. It doesn't have to be long screeds of, 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 of type. Yep. Because uh, Jonathan Kushner reminds us about what we all know, information overload, the problem in the digital age, um, and uh, therefore uh, the, question, the business of the press club. The system may not be trusted to deliver impartial information, so who are going to replace them as trust brokers in this uh, digital age? Uh, quick uh, comment, Richard. Look, I think it's people on the ground. It's the man from Chernobyl. 
and somebody who has the guts to go to Fukushima and walk the ground and talk to people who are the residents and say, you know, here's what I'm seeing or saying, and, and, and here, by the way, here's my first person uh, video of this, and it's a 30 second clip, and you know, all of these, l look at what uh, the coverage was from uh, Boston when you had the uh, marathon um, bombing and, and, and subsequent deaths. That coverage was led from social media initially. Now, some part of this was problematic, Nick, because they jumped to the conclusion that the wrong person had done it. Um, but then, again, that becomes the function of law enforcement to absorb what uh, was going on in the social stream and say, no, this is the wrong conclusion. Here's what we're doing. Here's how we're doing it. But it's this problem of, of knowing what's going on before social media, which in many uh, corporates and governments is simply impossible. I mean, QF32, the Qantas uh, near disaster with the A380, much was known from what, was, what had fallen onto an island off Singapore or, or the Indonesian island of Bataan, uh, because the, the kangaroo was sitting there while the plane was circling. But Alan Joyce, the chief executive, knew nothing about what was happening uh, back uh, in Sydney. Let me go to Greg's story, and then also to Sanjeev Sinha as well, please. Yeah, Nick, thank you. You mentioned before about the tyranny of real time, and we talk about middle management. And the idea that middle management knows everything anymore, and therefore they can top down things anymore, I think is an old idea. And in fact, the great opportunity for Japan is for middle management to be retrained on how to get the collective wisdom and innovative capacity of their team members involved to start bringing things up. And we see this all the time in Japan, that that uh, model is not being operated on because the people are being promoted into positions of middle management without being properly trained on gathering innovation from the team members. So I'm interested in the panel's comments on can we actually see Japan tap into that tremendous potential that is there that they haven't got to yet. Let me offer a, a few thoughts. Glenn, if I can just summarize what you've just said on decision-making before I go to Sanjeev Sinha. Uh, decision-making in Japan, everyone is responsible, so no one is responsible. Japanese leaders, especially bureaucrats, fundamentally don't trust the public, so they don't share information with them. And that further fuels the cynicism and, and distrust that the public has, as revealed in the Edelman poll results. Uh, Sanjeev. Microphone to Sanjeev, please. Because you talk about three different types of situations for, for Japanese companies. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, as foreigners living in Japan, and I think all of us would agree, there are lots of nice things about Japan as a country to live in. Very environment friendly, very safe. Uh, and there is a reason behind it. And I think the reason is the decision making process. The country takes time in planning very meticulously and then decide on it. And then the execution is very smooth and as per the plan. So that's how things work locally in Japan, which is very beautiful and worth praise. But then when you talk about international businesses, then the challenge is there because the world is changing very dynamically, especially the developing world and rest of the world as well. And that's where Japanese companies are falling behind because they try to use the same very meticulous planning model for international business and that doesn't work because rest of the world wants to move on and on quickly. And lastly, in the crisis management, what happened in Fukushima's case, you need even more dynamic kind of a decision making. And there you can't work based on your operating manuals. In Japan, there are operating manuals for each and every small thing, like organizing this conference. That's why this conference is so well organized. But that doesn't work in crisis situation. And that's where Japan, I think, failed terribly in the case of Fukushima. So I think these three situations need to be distinguished from each other, domestic business, international business, and crisis management, and they require different kind of ways to handle them. Richard, you straddle all of those areas. What's your advice? You know, it, it seems to me that um, business and government actually uh, look at each other in, in, a, in Japan as a very mutually supportive kind of uh, uh, enterprise. And I'm not so sure that that should go forward like that. I think that they should actually look at each other as quite distinct um, entities um, and that um, one, in a certain way, <laughs> is very tough on the other, <laughs> as opposed to being together with the other. Um, and that's going to be really key to the credibility of restoring nuclear energy, that the government is seen as a completely reliable, independent uh, kind of guardian of the people, as opposed to somehow in the deal. <laughs> How do you respond to that, uh, Shizaki-san? Crisis management 
I, I do agree with you that uh, we are not too good at it, and especially in the, in the government. And uh, uh, take, for example, if we, we have tornado, we, we recently have many tornadoes, but probably nobody knows which ministry is in charge of tornado damage. What? And hang what on, happens if, uh, hang you on. know... As an outsider, no one knows in Japan when you have tornadoes, who's in charge of tornado damage? Well, each individual damage, for example, roads, that goes to Ministry of um, Infrastructure, of course. Uh, if the um, forest is damaged, it goes to uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture. But as a whole, who takes care of the whole damage and who controls, who is the control tower? Of it. Has no one worked that out yet in Japan? And uh, uh, we've Forgive been, me, I'm uh, through, through Fukushima accident, we proposed to set up a, a damage control and uh, how we respond as a whole government uh, uh, by establishing a new organization, which is something like FEMA in the United States or uh, the system the Britain has uh, to respond to any kind of uh, uh, crisis, and, uh, which we don't have. Uh, in Russia, we had, uh, 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 I don't know, you said that. What's it? You say? Meteor. Meteor? Asteroid. Huh? Asteroid? Meteor? Asteroid? Meteor. Uh, whatever. <laughs> 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 yeah, that came down to Russian somewhere. I'm not sure, Russia or somewhere. And there was, we, we found out that the, the, there was a ministry uh, for emergency, emergency department or whatever you call it, but we don't have it. So uh, I think the Japanese have been so used to having no real crisis as ever, and, uh, but Fukushima accident really reminded us of the importance of this kind of uh, uh, system that we have been lacking for many years. I mean, I'm going to quote Glenn Fukushima, who's just uh, posted this. Can we expect real educational reform in Japan when, quote, thinking critically threatens the status quo and those in power? And Saskia Rock, who's a student here, to restore trust in politics, I think it's necessary to promote especially women. They can break into the old male crocodile culture. <laughs> Saskia, do you want to explain what the old male crocodile culture is, please? <laughs> Um, I'm from Belgium. Um, we have the same thing. People have very low trust in politics, and it's because the same people have been in politics, you know, for 50 years. And what they do when uh, government changes is they just hand over to the next boy, right? So what we see is when women come into politics, they've got a very high social responsibility because, I mean, we have the children and we want to make the world better for the children. So we don't go along with the boys, right? We want to, we want to make the world better. So I think, especially in Japan, I mean, there's such a huge role for women. Um, and, you know, of course, there are many nice men, but <laughs> um, I, I feel like as soon as they get older and they get established in, in power, um, they, all they think about is wanting to hold on to the power. So I think there's a role for women to break into that. And, you well, know, let me ask the male panel about this. Um, <laughs> would you feel, how, how do you I, want to address that, Shibusawa? Um, related, I mean, I think the biggest problem for Japan is not that it's male oriented or, you know, because in my household, my wife is very, very strong, very, very opinionated about what I do, you know, so. But she doesn't run the company. <laughs> exactly. So, so my, my point, my point is the biggest problem for Japan is the labor law, I think. Because I think for the third arrow, what I'm, what I'm hoping is relaxation of the labor law. Um, you know, Japanese, despite the foreign sort of uh, perception of being clueless, irrational people, are acting very rationally given the environment that they're, once they join a company, um, it's often difficult to go to another company at a higher level. Yeah, and so and, and so the 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 sort of the. Uh, liquidity of the employment market, I think, in Japan, especially at the higher level, you know, it's, it's, it, it needs to be 
boosted it, you know. So, so the bureaucrats are making a perfectly rational decision within their in the, within their environment because if they stick out their necks, they're not going to get their next post. And so they're 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 providing the right answer within the organization, but as an entire you know <laughs> well-being of the nation, they're not asking the right questions. Um, same for women, I think. The women once you know once like my wife, they, she left the you know the labor or she left the the working force to raise our children. And it's hard for her to get back in, um, just because you know, a lot of the labor restrictions, restrictions, because and, and things like that. So, um, I think what I'm hoping in the third arrow is that they really, because this is a very, very hard political, um, you know, <laughs> uh, decision. I realize, but but I think that's at the really core, core, core uh, of so sort of the stagnation here in Japan. Edelman, uh, Richard, do you think uh, does the Edelman Trust Barometer does it uh, reflect gender? Do you think there's uh, substance to what we've just heard? You know, Nick, it actually doesn't do gender. It does uh, income levels. And I think this is fascinating that the elites are much more trusting than the mass, which, which, which is counter to what you might intuit. Oh, because the elites read more media and whatever. But uh, in Japan, the uh, mass is more skeptical on nuclear, et cetera. But about, there, the, about, but, the, uh, about getting rid of the, crocod the male crocodile culture? Look, I have three daughters who are going to succeed me. I'm hoping for it. <laughs> I, I'm with you. Yes. <laughs> what, what's the gender uh, split in Edelman at the moment? We have about 65% uh, women, 35% men. But in management, it's more like 33% uh, are female. Okay, thanks. Nicholas Smith, uh, can I get the microphone to you? Because you talk about the law is an ass. Um, let me come to you. Uh, and while the microphone's on its way, uh, Arishi, uh, Arioshi Amori, I think the difference in information will be valueless in a few decades. In such terms, all information like global problems and issues must be shared. Everyone in the world can join to solve them and get reward. Nicholas, uh, your, your uh, pick up on the ability to say the law is an ass. Why do you say that? Sure, I mean, of course, where I went to school, I walked every day past a sign that says, uh, with fine disregard for the rules of footballers played in his day, uh, William Webb Ellis first picked up the ball. That's to say, the rules are there to be questioned. Your boss is there to be questioned. Uh, and what's so different about the West is you can turn around to a boss and say, that was a dumb idea. But where it fits in with what uh, Shivasawa is saying, and dare I bring in the, the sort of Judeo-Christian element to it, is that I also come from a culture where it's incredibly redemptive. And if you screw up, people forgive you. Whereas here, well, obviously, the way of the warrior is death. And if you screw up, you die. So the boss is trying to defend himself all the time um, and not saying, give me your ideas. I, I would love to know, because when you give me your ideas, you do my work for free for me. Shizaki-san, do you see that as a real blockage, an obstacle, this culture here in Japan, to addressing the things that uh, Richard's trust barometer has exposed? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't... Do you see point. what uh, Nicholas has just said uh, uh, about the price, if you get it wrong, as a, and the culture here, as a real obstacle to adopting the kind of flexibility that Richard has identified as necessary here in Japan? Uh, he might. He, uh, I, 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 would, I would say that he, he might be right. By uh, well, so in order to uh, uh, change the culture, I think uh, uh, we have to take up, take out the risk of the, the, the management to uh, 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 to do something that he believes. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, he cannot do something new, and so. Um, I, I, I do agree. Shubasawa-san? That if you screw, basically if you screw up, then you're, then you're out sort of mentality. Um, in a sense, yes, because like, you know, as, as, if you try to start up a business and if you fail, then it's a big, it's a big uh, minus mark. But as you know, as we all know, in venture business, uh, screwing up is a one, you know, it's a good way not to screw up the next time. Um, but I think this, uh, this um, um, mo notion of forgiveness, though, I think, I think Japanese are more forgiving uh, of, of their CEOs and, and people that actually screw up. Maybe that, that, that's, that's more of a problem. 
Richard, how do you see this fitting into what you see in your 67 offices around the world when it comes to the price of screwing up for reputation, internal promotion, and therefore a need for greater flexibility uh, <laughs> being part of the significant re-kind of architecting of, uh, of the system of governance within a company to learn how to respond to generate more trust for the public? Look, I think smart companies are um, setting themselves up in a way that uh, allows failure. In other words, you have an incubator at GE for, in Silicon Valley now for great new ideas. It's separated from the key lines of business. And so it's able to bring innovation in more easily. It's very hard, even in an American company, to, uh, to innovate. Microsoft, example. I mean, huge company. So it seems to me... Uh, You've got to nurture it. Dean Horry, you should talk about this more than me. But you have to create a context, a small context, in which people can sort of be the skunk works and, and, and do it. Well, can we go to a very successful skunk works? Peter, can I bring you in here? Because two angry birds have arrived from Rovio in Finland. And I should tell you, um, Peter and I shared a platform in Finland last year, two years ago. And he said, you're all stuffy. You're all looking as if you're dressed up for a corporate conference, and I'm in wearing that. So at the end of the conference, I went out and bought red kit, and I interviewed him at the end in red uh, to match him. I also did the same at the conference in Finland in Helsinki mm -hmm. at the beginning of July to make the continuity. Sadly, Peter, I didn't know you were going to be here today, but I don't have a tie. Yeah. But as you're, as you're listening to, to Richard particularly, hearing about the culture in Japan, big corporations, well-established, <laughs> the new innovative corporations, you're a new innovative corporation, risk and making errors is part of your success mm -hmm. to create Angry Birds. And how many do you employ now? 720. Oh, Tell us what your, your reflection yeah. is. But uh, actually, I didn't know that I was going to be here either, so I just flew in uh, this morning. And uh, actually, you, so you know where you've come to. I mean, you, you yeah, I, I know, I know. And actually, uh, we kind of like just uh, kind of like invited ourselves here, and that's how we do things at Rovio. So. So uh, really happy to be here and actually great to listen to the dis uh, discussion because I think that, uh, uh, you know, I loved when I heard uh, education being brought up because I think education is absolutely like key if you want to kind of create a new Japan, new environment here. And I think uh, what um, I was actually in Dalian at the, the kind of like the summer Davos last week and, and saw Richard there at this entrepreneurship uh, breakfast. But, uh, but I think... Uh, it, it's really interesting. Okay, we're from a small country, but we're actually like the closest neighbor of Japan in Europe. Uh, so, you know, so we're like kind of close, but uh, very similar problems. I mean, we used to have this company called Nokia and then, you know, like stuff happened. And I think that uh, Japan used to have, you know, very successful electronics companies and, you know, stuff happened. So uh, we have to reinvent ourselves. I mean, both Finland and Japan. And actually, one reason why we're here, okay, I'm here like uh, as a Rovio person and, you know, like promoting Angry Birds, but uh, we're actually organizing a startup sauna event tomorrow uh, evening for the local like startup community. And we are actually working very, very closely with the up and coming, you know, uh, not the big corporations, but the startups. So the startups in Europe, the startups in, in Japan, and we actually are doing this grassroots, not but Peter, top down. But, but about the, just quickly, because yeah. the time is running out. Yeah. The cult rather than advertising what you're doing in the sauna tomorrow. <laughs> but, it, but I think it's, it's important. But, but it's about the culture we're trying yes, to get to. Yes, the culture here. I mean, like if you look at kind of like Rovio, we did 51 games before Angry Birds. 52nd game was Angry Birds. Lots of, you know, not so successful, you know, and even some, you know, failures. And uh, you learn a lot from that. And then you kind of like just move on. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of like what is needed. It's all about the attitude. And I always kind of like jokingly say that it's easy for us because at Rovio we have a company full of people who think uh, they can walk on water. Why? Because they haven't been proven otherwise. You know, so this is kind of like it's all about the attitude of impossible being nothing. And I th uh, it's the exact same thing I see when I talk to startups here in Japan. So on the grassroots level, it's actually very, very healthy. The young guys, you know, they speak English and they, uh, they are actually uh, very much kind of like looking at the world you know, like startups everywhere. And I think that the future of, kind of like the Japanese economy is also with these guys. And, and that's actually, you know, like talking to the government here, you know, that's what you need to include in like economics and, and all of that, that you, you really need to get these guys involved. And, and that's what we're kind of like seeing uh, now, uh, you know, back in Finland that we get like our prime minister and a bunch of ministers involved and they actually, 
uh, at you know the summer Davos last week, they say that they don't know what you know why it's happening, why we have this explosion in startups. They have no clue. But hey, it's great. Let's support it. And I think that you'll see the same here in Japan. So you really need to address kind of like the culture and attitude. And that's why I was like so happy to hear about the education. But there's no price to failure in Angry Birds or in Robin No, but I think that we actually celebrate the failure. And I mean, like we learn from our failures. And, okay. and I always in Asia say that, you know, yes, you might lose face, but it's not like physical, you know, so it doesn't hurt really. Richard, we're into the last five minutes, by the way. It's really not about risk, though. This Fukushima mess is because I think the chief executive of TEPCO doesn't necessarily recognize the responsibility to the broader set of stakeholders. It is a responsibility to the shareholders, a need to work with government, and that's it. <laughs> and so you have to see that your job is to be good for society, not just good for making money. And you make money by being good for society. I know you guys believe that deeply. But for me, um, yes, you have to be willing to stand up and get grilled by Reuters or whatever, but also to take in the social feed. And that's risky, I suppose. But the major point is have a different attitude towards the role of business, um, which is we are the change agents. We are the good force. We are not um, a force for bad done properly. Right, let's move to, to, to closing because um, uh, Yoshi has to uh, make some final remarks. But there's one critical question here from Steve Baldwin for uh, Shiozaki-san. Should the government nationalize TEPCO in order to regain trust? Um, actually, I have been um, asserting the importance of uh, nationalization from the outset because we could foresee that uh, it's going to be um, well, in a really difficult situation where uh, government must take the responsibility of, of controlling the whole situation, uh, which is un, uh, unprecedented uh, on the globe. So uh, right now I'm proposing to establish something like a decommissioning authority in, in UK or similar mechanism that should bring the government, the whole responsibility of, uh, of decommissioning, and also including the uh, uh, this uh, the control of contaminated water, which is very very difficult to control. So I, I think we should uh, nationalize it and take the whole responsibility by the government. Therefore, Richard, a question again from Steve Baldwin: How can TEPCO turn around its PR issues? Uh, given the way it has scarred everything and the way you confirmed it created a stain right across the corporate world? Well, the first thing I would do is, uh, I don't know how many um, generating facilities they had, but if it were me, I'd put up a scoreboard and say, here's when it was opened, here's how good it is, if it's not good enough, here's our commitment to fix it, um, here's who's in charge, here's the person you can send emails to or whatever um, to get answers about the local facility. By the way, also we've appointed a very serious um, person who's come from government, who's an investigative type, has great environmental connections, and reports directly to the chief executive and to the chairman of the board. And that person has power over all of the operations and is responsible. Um, and be consistent about reporting out on your progress on fixing up or, and you also probably have to have a good bank, bad bank approach, meaning that which the government takes, just take, and then that which is the continuing operations, you know, then they can be viable. But the business model issue is very serious, right? shiozaki san is that an attractive uh, approach, do you think? Well, I've been pretty much involved in uh, non-performing loan issues, you know, and I think it's equivalent to that. And bad TEPCO, good TEPCO, that might bring a, a better situation to control everything. Because it, 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 right now, it's kind of, well, for the people working in TEPCO, it's like sentenced for 40 years. Yeah. And without any motivation to go forward. And I think we should, well, they deserve to have uh, motivation to work and motivation to raise kids. And uh, on everything, but now I think this situation doesn't allow the people working as hard as possible 
in the TEPCO uh, uh, for that purpose. Shubha san let me give the, the final word to you. By the nature of those who've gathered here on a public holiday, <laughs> everyone here is really very interested in these issues, but there are literally millions out there who are not party to this kind of conversation, right, but right. who are at the core of the problem uh, of trust uh, in business and uh, obviously government as well. But what kind of message can go out? And Do you feel that there is a potential for traction on this issue, or will there be a conservative response of bunkering down mm of getting stuck back into the same old ways. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. Um, it's been a really stimulating uh, session. Um, but one thing that really sort of bothered me was that this notion of, of culture was used in this context as a liability. And, and for Japan, I think it's a big, big asset. Um, and I was in the uh, Cool Japan session prior to this, and there were words coming out, keywords like extreme and playfulness. Um, words that wasn't used in this current session, you know? And, and the reason why I think uh, Japan was able to sort of excel in those areas of aesthetics was because it wasn't, it's not regulated, right? There's no ministry of otaku saying, this is the way you have to do things, you know? Uh, and so my, my message would be, you know, just, you know, f free us up. <laughs> there's a lot of good things here in Japan. If you look at the macro, Japan's a mess, yeah? But if you look at the micro, there's so many interesting things going on, and, and many of the people here are representation of that. Um, one last thing I would like to uh, propose is that um, I, th I think in Japan we use the word joho uh, hashin a means information sending, like sending out. And to me, that, that's not that's not that's not what we need, you know, because that's that's, that's that's a public relations sort of thing. What what we need, I think, is more of a global uh, opinion platform that you know there are individuals here in Japan that can think out of the box. You know that can and, and, and then connect with the global world, and I think this uh, one, this G1 Global, is one one you know excellent uh, platform. But I think there needs to be more other platforms. Uh, maybe it should be on the web. Should be more you know because otherwise, the global sort of uh, perception about Japan is based on BBC or you know Financial Times or Wall Street Journal. Um, but but there should be something in the English you know sort of context that says that's sent out from Japan as an opinion, which means that there's differing opinions, which means in the end you do have more dialogue going back and forth, uh, not with the right answer maybe, but maybe by asking the right questions. So final thought to you both of you. Um, if uh, the Edelman uh, organization or company were to do a, 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 another uh, follow-up, say in a year or 18 months, do you believe there would be measurable improvement or not on the metrics that Richard cited right at the beginning? I hope so, and I will do the best. You believe it's possible, do you? I think so, yes, of course. And I think we are in the right direction, but not much enough. I think so as well. I mean, there's some questions about corp Japanese corporations being stained, but the reality of the last nine months is that there's been more foreign investment buying in Japanese corporations than in recent memory. So somebody out there must think Japanese corporations are doing, trying to do something right. Great. Thank you all very much indeed. Well, thank you as well, because uh, a lot of you have been very energetic, and thanks very much for all your ideas. The messages have been great, and they've helped drive the debate in the direction which you've been thinking about as you've listened uh, to the three panelists. So thank you very much indeed for a, a very stimulating uh, hour and a half. Yoshi. Okay, this concludes third annual G1 Global Conference. And I have been so stimulated, exciting moment I had uh, excited about, I have learned a lot. And I was amazed about three things. One is that so many variety of nationalities who have presented both the panelists as well as the participants. And from, uh, like, uh, from Finland and also from Belgium and from Kenya and like a Korea and everybody a lot. And that's what has uh, made me so much surprised. The second is about the insight of the topics that we discussed and the quality of discussion we had through the participation of the panelists as well as participants. And that has been quite good. And thirdly, I was amazed with the uh, quality of uh, English by Japanese uh, <laughs> panelists. <laughs> and most of the cases, in, uh, Japanese people do not speak English so well, but I was quite amazed about the level of English capability by the panelists. And uh, this G1 Global Conference is being executed 100% in English. 
And uh, the purpose of it is also to make Japanese people more globalized and make every discussion to be as transparent as possible. So most of the discussions we had had become on the record. It will be published on the website and so that lots of people can learn, not only Japanese people, but also globally, whoever can understand English will be able to see what has been discussed. And this is so much important. We have been discussing this, the same kind of topics in Japanese, but we could only target to uh, reach out to only Japanese speaking people. But here in G1 Global, it's truly global uh, uh, conferences. And I'd like to thank uh, the media sponsors and uh, like uh, 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 Wall Street Journal, Japan Times, Fortune, Forbes, Bloomberg, and also VQ, who has uh, uh, transmitted uh, through the internet all the uh, all the uh, pictures and uh, uh, through the internet. And also, I'd like to thank all the participants, especially Nick Gowing, for coming over and uh, to uh, to G1 Global. I hope you will come again for next year. And we've been <laughs> coordinating this together with uh, Nick Gowing on this G1 Global. Moving on, we have uh, G1 executives targeting CEOs and directors of big corporations. So we'd like to convey what ha we had been discussed here to those uh, directors and big corporations. It will be held in November 4th. And also, we're going to have uh, a regional G1 summit, one in uh, G1 Kyushu, Okinawa, to be held at Fukushi, uh, Fuku uh, Fukushi, uh, Fukuoka City in Fukuoka City in February next year, and we're going to have a G1 Summit, and then we're going to have a G1 Under 40, and we're going to have a G1 Venture as well. So this movement will be able to become the platform for everybody to exchange ideas, meet friends, and collaborate on things, and make Japan, and Asia, and the world to move forward to a better place to be. So we'd like to thank you all, and we're going to have some Reception, dinner reception, right around the corner. Typhoon is gone. <laughs> there was a typhoon somewhere, but you know, right now it's gone. So we are going to have a great dinner and time, and we can relax over beer. So thank you all for participation, and thank you all very much.